Good evening. Um, on behalf of the Archivists of the United States, welcome to the National Archives and the William G. McGowan Theater. Um, and a special welcome to our good friends at C-SPAN, our partners in tonight's program. I'm Jim Gardner. I'm uh, executive for Legislative Archives, Presidential Libraries, and Museum Services here at the National Archives. So probably everything you're really interested in, I'm uh, responsible for, but there's plenty more at the archive. Um, before we begin tonight's program, um, I'd like to mention two programs coming up shortly in the same theater in McGowan. Uh, tomorrow, Friday, April 24th at noon, we'll have award-winning White House correspondent and presidential historian Kenneth T. Walsh. Uh, he will be discussing his book, Celebrity in Chief, A History of the Presidents and the Culture of Stardom, taking a look at the history of America's presidents and the need for modern presidents to, be, to also be celebrities. Then on Tuesday, April 28th at noon, again here in the McGowan Theater, uh, we'll have General Ann uh, Dunwoody, Dunwoody retired, uh, America's first female four-star general. Uh, she will be here to share her leadership lessons based on 38 years of service in the U.S. Army. And afterwards, uh, she'll be signing copies of her book, A Higher Standard. To find out more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, uh, please consult our monthly calendar of events. Uh, copies are available in the lobby upstairs along with the sign-up sheet so you can receive the calendar by mail or email or you may visit our website at www.archives.gov slash calendar. Another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. Uh, the foundation supports the work of the National Archives, especially its exhibits, uh, education activities, and public programs, all of which are near and dear to my heart, um, just like the one you are about to experience tonight. Uh, applications for membership in the National Archives Foundation may be found in the lobby, and as archivist David Ferriero likes to share, uh, no one has ever been turned down for membership in the foundation. <laughs> now, on with tonight's program. Uh, C-SPAN's year-long history series, First Ladies, Influence and Image, featured interviews with more than 50 preeminent historians and biographers. In the recently released informative book, these experts paint intimate portraits of all 45 First Ladies, their lives, ambitions, and unique partnerships with their presidential spouses. This series and the book provide an up-close historical look at these fascinating women who survived the scrutiny of the White House, sometimes at great personal cost, while supporting their families and famous husbands, and sometimes changing history. Our program tonight will feature a lively discussion with some of these contributing historians whom you'll hear more about shortly. To moderate tonight's program, we're pleased to welcome Susan Swain, the moderator for C-SPAN's First Lady's Influence and in Image. Susan Swain is president and co-CEO of C-SPAN, sharing responsibility for all operations of the Public Affairs Cable Network. She oversees programming and marketing for C-SPAN's three television channels and C-SPAN radio. She helped launch the Washington Journal, Book TV, and American History TV. She has also been involved in the creation of numerous C-SPAN history series, such as American Presidents, the Lincoln-Douglas Debates, and American writers. For over 30 years, she has been one of C-SPAN's principal on-camera interviewers. Most recently, on April 14th, First Lady's 
was released as a book by Public Affairs Books, featuring a collection of her interviews from the television series. It is the ninth book uh, Susan has edited for C-SPAN and Public Affairs. And as you noticed when you came in, um, we will have copies of the book available for sale after the program, and uh, she will be uh, signing copies uh, for you. Uh, so now, uh, let me turn the podium over to Susan Swain and to tonight's program. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience, and I really appreciate you braving the traffic into DC on a night when there's a Caps game. And for those of you watching at home on C-SPAN, thanks for being with us. So many of you were with us for the First Lady series, and it's fun to be revisiting some of those topics again. Uh, as Jim told you, well, actually what I wanted to start with was a quote from Abigail Adams. When she sent John off to the Continental Congress, she sent him with an exhortation. John, remember the ladies. And tonight we're going to do that for Abigail, so she should be happy. Because the lives of these first ladies are often forgotten, and they shouldn't be, because they're very interesting. And they've also made an enormous contribution to our history. What we tried to do with the series was personalize their history. And what we're going to try to do tonight is tell you some of those stories, along with some wonderful video from and film from the National Archives collection, and also some of their historic photographs, and also some of the clips from our own series. So we hope we'll inform you and entertain you, and along the way inspire you to ask some questions, because there's 30 minutes set aside at the end for your involvement in things that you are interested in. Uh, our goals tonight are to learn about the First Lady's contributions to the presidency, and since we are now embarking on a new presidential campaign, can you believe it's time for that already? Uh, we are already looking at the spouses of the candidates, and I say spouses instead of wives, because the Clinton entrance into the campaign kind of changes the whole dynamic and what our definition of a first spouse might be. So that will be something we'll be thinking about as well. Well, to whet your appetite for what you're going to see ahead, before I introduce our panelists, I want to show you a priceless piece of film. This is from the National Archives collection from the Truman Library, 1945, National Airport, a place we all know very well, when Bess Truman, brand new first lady, was asked to do a very early event to christen a, an air ambulance and watch what happens. Let's take a look. At the National Airport, ambulances with wings, one each for Navy and Army, ready to be christened by Mrs. Harry S. Truman, who, with her daughter Margaret, will do the honors in her first public appearance. But Mrs. Truman is in for a surprise. By an oversight, the champagne bottle, unlike this one, hasn't been properly prepared etched to break the glass on impact. And glass cutting is behind successful christenings like these. Now Mrs. Truman, unaware that her bottle is not prepared, Mrs. Truman kept her cool, as you can see, but guess what she was feeling inside? Mortally embarrassed. And what, what happened as a result of that is she elected not to do any more public appearances. Now, that's not a possibility for women today who hold this role, because with the next presidency, the Eisenhower administration, television burst onto the scene and began following first ladies everywhere. Bess Truman was really the last who was able to live a private life as much as she could while she was in the White House. Uh, but this is a great, a really great entrance into what we're going to be talking about tonight, about women who are sometimes thrust into these roles by history and have to learn to adopt to the glare of the spotlight. I've got four fabulous panelists I want to introduce to you tonight. 
Now, I, you heard that there were 56 people involved, 56 experts involved in our television series, a year-long series from President's Day 2013 to President's Day 2014. And when we put them together in the book, the reason we did the book is because there are lots of books on First Ladies, but never such a broad collection of, of various points of view under uh, one set of covers. And we're delighted to have four of the people who were part of that process. First, you're going to meet Carlos Barraza Anthony. He is the historian of the National First Ladies Library in Canton, Ohio. I lost count the number of First Ladies books, somewhere over a dozen that he has written, um, and has lots of also online material about them. And he's joining us here from Los Angeles. Carl, let me welcome you. Thank you for coming. Edna Medford is local. She is the chair of the history department at Howard University and much published herself. She is a Lincoln expert specializing in the Civil War and Reconstruction, and she has had an incredibly busy year. She was part of the National Commission on the Lincoln uh, Centennial, Bicentennial Celebration. Carl was in my seat, but I would have claimed it, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and she has spent the entire year with the commission attending all of those Lincoln events. So as sad as we were to reach the anniversary of Lincoln's expiration last week, She's probably breathing a little sigh of relief that she will be able to reclaim some of her time back. So let me introduce Edna Green Medford of Howard University. <laughs> now I've managed to do something that no moderator should do. I have two panelists by the same first name. So let me introduce you to Carl Cannon. Carl is the Washington Bureau Chief of Real Clear Politics. He has covered every single presidential campaign since 1984 and has covered all the White Houses since then. He is an author himself, a biographer, and he is also a historian. If any of you sign up for his daily Real Clear Politics morning briefing, you get the daily politics, but you always get them with a history lesson because he loves history. He comes by this passion for newspaper and politics honestly. His father, Lou Cannon, covered Ronald Reagan as a governor in California and was Ronald Reagan's biographer. So he grew up in that environment. Great friend of C-SPAN, as are all our panelists, Carl Cannon. And our final panelist is, is someone I've just gotten to meet over the past few years working on this series, Krissa Thompson. I hope you read her byline in the Washington Post. Uh, she is a reporter who is covering Michelle Obama and uh, has many, written many detailed stories. She just told us that she's just finished a story on First Gentlemen, which is perfect for our, our discussion tonight, which is going to be in tomorrow's newspaper. In addition to covering Laura Bush, she has also uh, uh, covered Laura Bush as well as the, the Michelle Obama, and she's beginning, as I said, to look ahead to the new crop of candidates. So she joins us to bring the journalist modern day perspective to this discussion. Krista Thompson. <laughs> Now, I know that many of you bring your cell phones to these, and we've got a, we've got a Twitter account set up tonight. So as I mentioned, the questions are going to be at the one hour point. But if you see some interesting topics along the way and you want to send us a tweet, I'm going to be getting them right here. I promise not to be too distracted by that. And I'll, I'll mix in your, uh, tw your Twitter questions as well. And that's for our C-SPAN audience watching at home. Use the tag at First Ladies, and I'll be getting them and using them throughout the uh, section. So. Welcome, everybody. We're going to start each of our sections tonight with clips. And the first one is really delving into our major topic tonight, which is that duality of the public life and the private life that all of these now women have been forced into by circumstance, some of them uh, happy partners along the way, the other history thrust them into the role. But we ask a lot of them in this role. And we're going to start with a clip from an interview that we did at C-SPAN with Michelle Obama when she was new into the role talking about this balance between private life and public responsibilities. Let's watch. I think every First Lady brings their unique perspective to, to this job. Um, if you didn't, you couldn't live through it. Uh, I think to the extent that this feels natural to me at any level, and I would never have thought that living in the White House and being First Lady would feel natural, it's because I try to make it me. <laughs> Uh, I try to bring a little bit of Michelle Obama into this, but at the same time respecting and, and valuing the tradition that is uh, America's. This is not a new concept. 
uh, in the book, what we did is include one quote from every first lady to start the chapter. And I'd like to share with you the quote that we chose for Martha Washington, the first in this role. I never go to the public place, she wrote. Indeed, I think I'm more like a state prisoner than anything else. There are certain bounds for, set for me which I must not depart from, and as I cannot do as I, like, as, I am, as I like, I'm obstinate and stay at home a great deal. <laughs> now, uh, more than 100 years later, Grace Coolidge in the White House wrote this. I was thinking about her role. She said, this was I, and yet not I. This was the wife of the President of the United States, and she took precedence over me. My personal likes and dislikes must be subordinated to the consideration of those things that were expected or required of her. So it's something, Carl, that First Ladies have been struggling with, how to maintain the sense of self with all of these responsibilities thrust upon them. And, and, and I'm so happy you, you, you begin the discussion this way because, um, you know, it, it really goes down uh, to the very root, I think, of what has always been a, a, a matter of fascination, not only for the American public, for, but for the world public. As you all probably know, you hear so often from foreign journalists who are interested in um, the role of First Lady, and I think we're going to see uh, perhaps uh, at some point, certainly, the role of, of a first gent, you know, that it really isn't just about gender, that it's really about unaccountable power. And the, as you said, those thrust into it. So I think early on, uh, when this sort of sudden awareness, you have to remember in the 19th century, there was a real sense of a woman's name should not be in public. And so the whole concept of first lady was like, you know, there was a real co conflict for who they were as people to have this public uh, interest in their lives. But, you know, Jackie Kennedy, I think, said it best. She said, when she, during the 1960 campaign, she said, you pick three or four stories that are real about yourself that illustrate a point, a good point, about yourself or your family, and you just you let them get, get, give them out, and that's it. And, that's gonna be, and you retell those same stories over and over again, and you try and just use that, and that's how much of your real self, a certain percentage, you give to your persona. But and we didn't have media coverage of anywhere near what we have today, and yet even the early first ladies felt the glare. Oh, absolutely. And if you think of someone like Martha Washington, who was the first and who was actually setting the tone for everyone who followed, it must have been incredibly difficult for her. I mean, she probably had the same kind of scrutiny, in a sense, that her husband did, probably more so uh, than he did. People knew her, of course. Uh, she had always been... Uh, around the winter camps uh, with her husband, and so the soldiers certainly knew her. People appreciated what she had done before she became First Lady, and I think after she became First Lady, too, she was pretty popular, but people did begin to criticize because this is new territory for her, and she doesn't know quite how to behave. All she has is the example of Europe, of European royalty. And so she's trying to uh, establish some practices that would be uh, in keeping with what they would have been doing uh, in Europe. And Americans uh, resented that. They, they certainly did not uh, want her to go in that direction. So she had a tremendous burden. And someone like Martha, who had spent all that time during the revolution with her husband, supporting her husband, all she wanted was just to be able to go back home and be a private citizen. Let me jump to Krista and, and ask you about watching Michelle Obama as closely as you have. Now, that clip was from her early days. Did you see a growing comfort with the role over the years, uh, a maturation into it? Absolutely. Uh, I think initially, and she kind of described herself in the 2007 campaign, and her husband told stories about, you know, he needed to get her blessing and that it was a process in order to do that. Uh, but you see her now, and she's fully bought into the role. She talks about it, about it as being a bright spotlight. And whatever she stands in front of, the light shines there. And so how do you use that? How do you use that platform? And so I think for her, being able to see the value in the celebrity that came with the role, in the press attention, which she also is not very comfortable with, I was interested to hear Carl say that about Jackie Kennedy, because I think First Lady subsequently have also done that, share with us a few stories, but kept a piece of themselves 
behind. Um, and, and, and so Michelle Obama does that as well. Uh, but you see her enjoying the role, especially when she's with children, when she's pushing issues uh, that she enjoys. Um, you know, and, and I, I think that growth is going to continue. And she and her husband are young, so they're not going anywhere. So we'll be able uh, to see how she continues to engage with the part public. So Carl uh, uh, Cannon of the every man up here is named Carl. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it either makes it easy or difficult. <laughs> so if. Um, Looking over the First Lady since 1984 election that you've seen up close and covering them, have any of them really struggled with this private-public duality? Well, you know, that clip that you showed of Michelle Obama was, uh, excuse me, of, of the, two, the two quotes, um, she, Grace, Grace Coolidge. Coolidge and Martha Washington. Mrs. Obama gave an interview yesterday. Was it yesterday to the kids? Yes. She hit on both of those themes in that interview. She says, you know, what don't you like about the other kids? So they'll ask you, you know, what do you, mm -hmm. well, you can't go out, she says. Yeah. You can't, I'm stuck here. You, you can't just go in, out. And the other thing, they said, did you always want to be a first lady? And this, I was thought of the Grace Coolidge line. No, she said, I wanted to be a pediatrician. So that's not what she wanted to be when she grew up. But to me, Michelle Obama has embraced the role in an uncommon way, mm -hmm. um, more than any yeah. of the others I've covered. Hillary Clinton's an exception. She saw it as a, as a well, obviously as a stepping stone. It's, it's, it, she, and she often talked about Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, and it's as if Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt could have run for president now. Right. We'd, nobody, we would, they would have handed her the nomination. Party would have been hers if we had this environment. And so Hillary Clinton it sort of can be the personification of Eleanor Roosevelt 50 years later. Um, but in terms of just embracing all of this, this role for what it is, Michelle Obama to me is almost a transformational figure. I've been, I don't cover the White House anymore. I covered it for 15 years. Now I edit a person who covers the White House, so I have to, I can sort of say what I think a little more. <laughs> and uh, I, I, if Alexis Simendinger is watching this program, you still have to be objective about Michelle Obama, but I don't. Yeah, the transformational concept is interesting though because Eleanor Roosevelt was deemed transformational, but no one who followed her did as she did. So, Susan, can I explain really quickly what sure. I meant by that? I, Michelle Obama is the first African American first lady. We talked about that. People have written about that. You've written about that. Right, absolutely. She's also, and I, I think, something even broader than that. She's the first, I want to say, post Title IX first lady. She she walks with a kind of confidence. You see these studies if you if you've been at college campus lately. These you know. Girls, when they're little, they're just like the boys. They're athletic, and because they mature a little faster, they're just as good at athletes. And then they get to an age where they slouch and they do this. And Michelle Obama doesn't do that. And she is she she walks and she she has a confidence, a physical confidence, a confidence in her mental abilities. Just is her self confidence to me as a person is an sort of an inspiration. May, may I just add very briefly onto that? I think something that's really it's so easy and so fascinating when when we all have on, about public figures the facts of their story and that we know, you know what, what their resume is, what they did, and how often we forget those things. But Michelle Obama has perhaps the, the greatest degree of executive experience before coming to the White House since Lady Bird Johnson. And when I look at what, Chris, what you said about Mrs. Obama, I think she, one reason that a lot of these people are willing, including, look, look at the Clintons, willing to give it up, their privacy and, you know, in the intrusions, is really that opportunity to really make a permanent change in perhaps the way the American people think or perceive something. And we're really talking about some profound things here. Lady Bird Johnson really prof profoundly helped change the way Americans think about their visual environment as well as the safety of it. And has essentially been forgotten, but she was part of that. She gave velocity to that movement, as I think Michelle Obama does now, about what we eat. In 50 years, people might forget that she was involved, but she's been part of that. And I think the chance to do that is why a lot of them say, I'll give up some of my privacy. Now, it is, it is often a learning curve, and I'm thinking about modern uh, first ladies that we've all seen. Nancy Reagan, for example, uh, thought that it was going to be like Sacramento, 
when she got to Washington, Carl, and it was not quite the same when she got here. No, she didn't really like Sacramento that much. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nancy Reagan got you know tough press coverage here, and the first first lady to get tough press coverage, and I I'm willing to be corrected on this, but you know is Mary Todd Lincoln. You know she's because it's the, the sectarian nature of that war. She's written about she's fair game. You know she's a southern sympathizer. She's a spendthrift. Um, she's a hysteric. We're still at it. Uh, Slate had a piece five years ago. Uh, was Mary Todd Lincoln bipolar? 2010, this poor woman is, we're still beating up on her. <laughs> Nancy Reagan got some of that kind of press coverage when she first arrived. And how did she regroup? We're gonna show a clip. A you know bit how later. she regrouped. Okay, well, we'll wait and show people. <laughs> how she, uh, I'm thinking about an example with Hillary Clinton during the campaign early on, the two for one, and I'm not gonna stand by, uh, and by, by my man and stay home and bake cookies. How did that campaign recover? How did she recover from the learning curve of uh, presenting herself that way. Or maybe she didn't, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> you know, the Clintons, I'll say this about, I'm gonna quote a friend of mine, Mark Salter, who was, some of you may know his books, he writes with John McCain, and he's sort of John McCain's alter ego. And the, during the, when the impeachment, when the Lewinsky story first <coughs> broke, Salter was walking down the street, a cigarette in his mouth, and he looks out at me and says, can this guy take a punch or what? <laughs> That's, he was talking about Clinton, and in McCain world, that's as high a compliment as there is, right? Well, I'd say the same thing about Hillary Clinton. I mean, both of these people, they, they, they'll take everything that you dish out, and, uh, and they'll, you know, to quote Harry Truman, pay it back with interest. Yeah, I'll, I'll <laughs> add to that about, about Hillary. Uh, in 92, she was one of the first uh, presidential or candidate spouses to participate in the uh, cookie bake-off recipe contest. So part of how she responded was, you know, she softened her image. She was game for putting out a cookie recipe after she said, I don't sit around baking cookies. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of, you know, trade-offs that first ladies have to make. Now let me stay with Michelle Obama and her early lessons on the campaign trail because she did have some. We think about how little political experience at the national level right. they really had as they were embarking on this big effort. Uh, but I re well, remember the, the comments that she made, uh, one of them being the proud of my country comment. What happened inside the campaign? Was there a major pullback, a regrouping? Did they, how did they approach that? Well, you know, she didn't have much of a team at that point. It was still early on, and she was winging it, and she was being herself, which she had always done when her husband campaigned for Senate or state legislator, that, that type of thing. And audiences, you know, when she was in small places in Iowa, New Hampshire, uh, they were responding to her, but this time it was caught on television. And the press corps, which had largely ignored her because they were, you know, still covering the primaries, tuned in at that second. And the campaign's response was to, you know, start to send her some advisors uh, so that she would then have some guidance to say, you know, you're not just you're not talking to your girlfriend, you're not even just talking to the people in that room, you're talking to all of America. And so, you know, it was a matter of making sure that she stayed in line with what the entire campaign was doing and was hopey and changey, you know, like everyone else. And I think we saw her flow into that. And she's talked about herself as being a real sort of planner and perfectionist and um, worried a great deal that she would harm her husband's campaign and we see her, you know, almost, it wasn't a complete 180 because she wasn't a horrible campaigner then, um, but just in terms of, you know, not talking about him leaving his socks around so much or that he's stinky and snorry, which were things that were in, you know, her initial stump speech, those things start to come out. Um, the ideas are still there, but they're in a much more palatable mm -hmm. fashion. And, and as she, she did become more cautious, but she still retained a part of herself. So she's still Michelle Obama. And I think that that's what's so likable about her. Mm -hmm. She has not become the political wife where everything has to be perfect. 
there are times when she decides that enough is enough and I'm going to be that person back in, on the south side of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we appreciate so much about her. And it's true for many uh, of the most popular first ladies who may have been very willing to support their husbands, but they didn't give their all. They didn't give up everything about themselves, which is exactly what we were talking about. Yeah, that's ago. a nice segue into uh, the two major categories that these women fall into. Those who are themselves politicos from the get-go, they have it in their bones, and they, they uh, find a partner and go along for the ride willingly and, and are helpmates. And then later on, we're going to talk about the ones who maybe history thrust into the, play, into the role and, and had to learn to adapt. But let's start with those political partners. And I have a clip for you again. This is, uh, again, from the uh, National Archives LBJ Library. And it's a doozy. Uh, this is uh, actually an audio clip, because you might have known that Lyndon Johnson taped all of his telephone conversations in the White House. Lyndon Johnson knew that he was recording. The people on the phone, including Lady Bird, we later found out, did not know that they were being taped, uh, making a record for history. And, it, and it's, a, it's quite a wonderful one for scholars. But this is a conversation where Lady Bird is critiquing Lyndon Johnson's performance at a public event. Let's listen. the reason why we should talk about first ladies. Because what other advisor could be that candid to a, a president? Stu Spencer, maybe. Sorry? <laughs> Stu Spencer, maybe. Uh, <laughs> what, so what are you hearing Wasn't there? her family, own, they own television stations yes. or something, so she had the background, you That's know, right. and so as an advisor, because first ladies in some ways are to their husbands, whether it's in an official capacity or not, they bring that eye because she, you know, she wants him to be as successful as he does. And, and, and I think that clip shows you too, you know, when you talk about this role of First Lady, the various um, attributes that as, as simply as human beings that they bring to the table. Mrs. Johnson, I think like Mrs. Obama, thinks in a very organized way. They're very well structured in their mind. Jackie Kennedy was famous for, I don't have a schedule. I like to do things spontaneously. And, and different ones, bring different strengths. And I think Mrs. Johnson, with her love of words, she had a degree in journalism, um, you know, her love of writing, her love of cadence, uh, her love of, uh, of, 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 of rhythm, and, but also, like you said, the, the, the media experience brought that, you know, and that's not necessarily political in terms of policy, but it, it ends up having a political uh, result. Edna Medford, this uh, is not a new phenomenon. We have a, an, an image from the Polk administration. So we're going to go back in time. And, and as Carl Anthony said, this was a time when women were supposed to stay in their sphere. But Mrs. Polk didn't stay in her sphere quite so well. Can you tell us about her? No, she did not. Uh, this was a time, uh, the cult of domesticity or the cult of true womanhood, when women were really appendages to their husbands. Um, they were not supposed to have political ideas of their own. Uh, they certainly were not supposed to voice those ideas if they did have them. Mrs. Polk had those ideas and did voice them, at least to her husband. 
and she uh, reviewed his speeches. She actually uh, tried to influence people uh, to uh, see things his way. She tried to influence him as well, uh, and she did influence him as, as far as we know. And so she's definitely stepping outside of that role of the average or typical woman during that period, or what was expected of a woman during that period. Uh, she and other uh, first ladies of that era did not always follow that, that pattern of you are to be, uh, you, you're to be the hostess at the party, and it's okay to give these, these parties, because they are political, they're not just entertainment, there's not just this emptiness there. There's a reason why you're doing this. But she goes much further than that. She's not terribly interested in the parties, but she is interested in the politics. And she does help her husband to get where he wants to be. So she's supporting the whole idea of manifest destiny uh, in terms of, of the support for him at home, but also beyond that. We have one, one quote I remember in the book of, the uh, members of Congress at the time saying to the president, I'd rather talk politics with your wife than with you. <laughs> yes. so she's pretty good at what she did. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I have um, another image, and this is of, we mentioned Mary Lincoln. And you were talking about how we're still discussing her mental capacity, but we have her in the political partner because she was indeed a, a political partner to Abraham Lincoln. Carl, let's start with you and talk a little bit about that. Well, I suspect if we'd had tape recorders back then, <laughs> you would have heard for these mid 19th century presidents a lot of conversations like that. When Lincoln finds out he's won the presidency, he turns to her and he says, Mary, Mary, we won, we, he says. Um, when Grant is inaugurated, he is a slightly more edge to it, but he turns to Julia Grant and he says, well, my dear, I hope you're satisfied. <laughs> so <laughs> we think maybe she pushed him a little bit <laughs> to run and to be involved in politics. And, and so I, I think those conversations, that, that Look, you don't tape your spouse without telling them. <laughs> True. But I bet if you'd had tape recorder, I bet there's all kinds of conversations you would hear like that in the campaigns, in the, not just in the White House, in the governor's mansions, getting these people to run. But and, uh, once they got to the White House and the war started raging, she was shut out, wasn't she? She was totally shut out. First of all, she was a Southerner, and there were many Southerners still uh, because those, those uh, Union states were, were still there, uh, the slaveholding. Union states, the border states, but she had relatives who were fighting on the side of the Confederacy. So she could never be trusted. Uh, it was alleged that she was a spy. She spent too much money. Uh, she acted uh, less than sane sometimes. Uh, and she embarrassed her husband in public, which is something first ladies were not supposed to do. But you know you have to sort of understand what's going on with Mary Lincoln because this is a woman who had lost her son before she got to the White House, lost another son while in the White House, had a husband that was not always easy to get along with. I think we sometimes forget that Lincoln had his issues as well. Yeah. And this is a woman who's very bright, who understands politics and loves politics, but she was born a woman. And so she does not have the ability to do what her husband can do by virtue of the fact that she was born the wrong gender. And so she is living vicariously through him, I think. She wants him to be president, but she certainly did not anticipate, I think, the kind of vilification she would get once she got to the White House. We're going to have to fast forward through lots of history with, because our hour is going to go quickly. But Eleanor Roosevelt ends up in a lot of these categories tonight. Uh, how would you? assess her, Carl Anthony, in terms of her partnership with FDR, political partnership? They were driven by the same principles. That, you know, people get so petty in looking at, you know, these people who've been married for so many years. He, yes, he had a, you know, um, a, a physical and um, emotional relationship with somebody who was very close to her, her personal secretary during World War I, and she offered him divorce, and that was, it was traumatic, no question. But, when she sort of pulled away and looked at it, she realized there's nobody else I share values with like, like I do with him, that they believed, in, and they were both progressives, even though they were, they were Democrats, very much like um, her uncle Theodore Roosevelt. And, and that's what led them to work together. And, and it was also love because 
of his physical disability. She did not, she believed he was talented. And she believed more in his talent than her own at first. And she really thought, you cannot lay fallow. You must lead. And, and as both first as governor of New York, and that's really the, 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 the tryout, in a sense, for her role as first lady. And then with the depression hitting, I mean, and, and everything almost smashed as far as what we know in terms of American life, that's, she takes advantage of that vacuum where everything is up in the air, and that's where she starts saying, well, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to do. And it's always under the guise of, but I'm simply just a devoted wife helping my husband, <laughs> you know? And in a way, it was. But she did not really start developing her own agenda until the second and the third term, particularly on civil rights. And when he was always more political in saying, well, this is what we can do, what we can't do, she always brought him back to principle. And so while they continued as political partners to share the same values, he often you know, abandoned them for the practicality. And she always was sort of sticking with them in, in a more sort of lofty way. Let me move on to, uh, well, I've, I do have one more clip. And I'm actually going to ask you, Krista Thompson, to watch this. Even though you didn't cover these first ladies, okay. you'll recognize the archetype because there are two modern first ladies, both full political partners, but they approach it very differently in the way they describe it. These are from C-SPAN interviews. And first is Nancy Reagan, and the second, Hillary Clinton. Let's watch. I just had little antennas that went up <laughs> and told me when somebody had their own agenda and not, and not Ronnie's. And, um, and then I'd tell him. He didn't always agree with me, but I'd tell him. And this is usually worked out. What was the first thing that you would notice when somebody had their own agenda? I, you just know. You just, I, you can't say it's something that you, you just know. If, you're, if you have those antennas. <laughs> when I worked on health care, a lot of people thought that I shouldn't be making recommendations about legislation uh, or that I shouldn't be involved in working on behalf of what my husband asked me to work on, which was one of his primary um, objectives, um, because they thought that that was somehow inappropriate, uh, that if you exercise influence, do it behind the scenes where nobody can see you. I find that curious. I mean, to me, I'd like to know what goes on in front of the scenes um, because uh, I'm very, um, very much the kind of person who believes that you should say what you mean and mean what you say and, and take the consequences. I mean, just like anybody else uh, who's involved in uh, public life. It's, it's fascinating because there's so many ways to be political, right? And especially for a spouse to be political. We know that Hillary Clinton, as First Lady, set up an office in the West Wing, which was like, oh my goodness, uh, you know, a, a clear indication that she wanted to be political, not behind the scenes, but in public. And you know, when she was working on healthcare, she spoke to the business roundtable, and she, you know, was a public figure in pushing this policy and sought to engage people uh, and work on it in front of the scenes. Um, you know. Nancy Reagan, and we can imagine, she was very frank about the ways in which she was political behind the scenes, but we can imagine the ways that every first lady over dinner conversation, or if you want to call it pillow talk or what have you, is able to express those views. And uh, Michelle Obama has talked about it less, but her husband has said, talked about the ways in which she's influenced him, especially on issues like same-sex marriage and immigration, social policy, you know, and he kind of describes her as, in, in some ways, pricking his conscience uh, on those things. And so, um, you, you know, you have to see first ladies as political figures in that way, no matter if they choose to operate uh, in the way that Nancy Reagan did or in the way that Hillary Clinton has. Carl, you want to say something? Well, Nancy, Nancy's very kind of modest there. She says, yeah, I know when people have their own agenda. And I, I tell Ronnie, and it usually works out. Well, yeah, Don Regan got fired. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it worked out, for not always for them. And she's just very, kind of understating it there. She was a very powerful force in this town for the eight yeah, years of administration. You know, this, yeah, it's a thing. I've, I've never asked a president about it. I, I've always meant to. But the First Lady is one of the few people in the world who calls that person by his given name. 
You know, that, that has a power that if you think of his brothers, maybe his parents, maybe his, his commanding officer if he was in war and knew him when he was 19. But, you know, there's five or six people in the world who don't call him Mr. President, who call him by his name. The First Lady always calls these guys by their name. And, and that's a, that it, 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 not only, it conveys the kind of intimacies there. And this is a person, as Nancy said, and, and this is true of Hillary Clinton too, that per, the president knows the First Lady has their interests are. It doesn't mean their judgment's infallible, but he has confidence that their heart's in the right place. That's a power. Right. So we're going to look at some First Ladies other than Bess Truman, uh, who yeah. found themselves in the job uh, either by marrying someone whose aspirations they weren't quite sure of when they got married, uh, or uh, uh, knew it, but really never loved politics all that much. And then there's another kind of reluctant first lady, those that got there and were shut out by the staffs around them. So we're going to start with one woman, uh, Pat Nixon, who had uh, an interesting relationship with the presidency and her husband's quest for the presidency. This was her very minor speaking engagement at the Republican convention. Let's watch. Well, I certainly can say this is the most wonderful welcome I've ever had, and for those... <laughs> I listened to Jimmy Stewart's uh, introduction of me, and I was so appreciative and grateful to him for being here today, and he certainly is right. I stay in the wings and don't come out in front too often. So this is quite unusual for me, but I do want to thank all of you for your friendship and your loyal support and for the planning this wonderful evening for me. I shall remember it always. And thanks to the young people for this great welcome. So Patricia Nixon, uh, what, why did she end up in our reluctant uh, role? reluctant or unhappy role? I think um, the reality of, of, of what was becoming modern politics, the media, the money, the, the partisanship, the attacks, the questions of, of, of ballot, you know, uh, you know, stealing votes, and, and I think she got disgusted with it. And I think um, she always felt she had been actually active and, and interested in politics before she married Nixon. She was a, 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 a supporter of, of Al Smith. She was a Democrat at, as a young woman, um, met the Roosevelt's. And, um, and they did their first congressional campaign together, together as a team. Together, and used her inheritance, her very little bit of inheritance. And there was a break-in, by the way, and their headquarters mm -hmm. where, where all the literature was taken. But I think over time, she just really got disgusted with, with the way things were. And this 1960 election really broke her. They had come so close. And then he had, he did, she said, don't run, don't run, don't run. And he asked her permission uh, in 62 to run for governor. And he, she said yes. And then he lost that. And then the famous story where she, he, she made him write down. And she put in her wallet a promise, I will not run for politics again. And of course. Um, he broke it, and, and uh, you know, that, that ambition with all of these men, I mean, we were talking about there's a certain insanity to wanting to be president. <laughs> and um, um, so she was there, and she saw, and she knew the opportunity from eight years as, as, as president's wife under Eisenhower, the opportunity she had, but she, when she did make recommendations like a very important one, while those tapes, which she didn't know about, like Mrs. Johnson, She's recorded on a lot of the tapes with Nixon, um, uh, were still technically held by him at private property. Legally, they should be destroyed. And he, of course, he didn't listen to her. Didn't follow her advice. Uh, Carl, Carl Cannon, uh, the Nixon staff, the, the top staff in the Nixon White House, shut her out as well, didn't they? Yes, but she didn't mind being shut out. As, as Carl Anthony said, she was tired of politics before the White House even, before she became the White House. Remember, she'd been the vice president's wife, she thought they were done with it. Um, but, you know, and there's all kinds of personal reasons some women don't want this role. Bess Truman, who we showed that hilarious clip of her breaking the bottle, and that must have been a hard bottle to break because she was a, she was a better athlete than Harry Truman was. He knew her, they were in grade school, she was a very good third baseman, he used to tell people. So she could swing the bat, but 
she had a secret that she was keeping. Her father had committed suicide at a time this was a stigma and she took it hard. Her mother took it particularly hard. Her, mother, her mother's mental health never really recovered from that. She didn't even want to be here when, when Harry Truman was president. She would come, bring her mother to the White House, then they would go back to independence. And she really didn't, she decided she had a more important role in life than being an appendage to a president, which was which keeping her family together. And I think we forget sometimes that those, these are people and they have these burdens on them. And, and, and yet, man, I had a very, very important addition that after Truman dropped the bomb, the first atomic bomb, she came back from Missouri. She advised him the night before he dropped the second on Nagasaki, according to the memoirs of Alonzo um, Fields, who was a, a White House butler. So, I mean, she was in on the big decision. Edna Medford, I'd like to kind of ask you to look back in your period of history. And who would be the, the women that were in this unhappy or reluctant class that, that folks should know about? I think foremost would be Jane Pierce. Uh, she did not want to be, want her husband involved in politics. She certainly didn't want to have the role of first lady. Uh, she even, it's not even about being in the White House. She didn't want to be in politics at all. And her husband had promised her that he would get out of politics. And, for time there, he had. Uh, she fainted when she learned that he had won his pod party's nomination uh, for the presidency. And she's coming to the White House with the loss of a child again. Uh, so there's this woman in the White House who is suffering from depression because she's mourning the loss of a child. She's having to deal with all of the duties of being a political wife, of being the first lady, and a husband who doesn't quite understand why she's so reluctant. So she was a very unhappy first lady. I think more than any of the others, she, she certainly. We chose this picture because this is the son that she lost. It was 11-year-old Benny. She had previously lost, their, they had lost their other two sons. So this was the third, just before they came to Washington for the inauguration and he died in front of their eyes in a train accident. Uh, the, the president actually, the child was ejected from the train and the president went down and carried the bleeding child back up to his parents. It's such a tragic story. So how, how does a, a parent recover from that? Mm -hmm. And being in a place where she didn't want to be, so you really mm -hmm. can sympathize with the situation that she was in. And, and being first lady to a president who is, the country is in turmoil at this time. This is the crucial decade. And so her husband is experiencing all of these tensions between the North and the South. And she's a part of that. She's a witness to that. And she doesn't want to be, but she has no choice. So we have many other first ladies, interesting first ladies in this category, including Louisa Catherine Adams, Elizabeth Monroe, the great story of Ida McKinley, uh, and, um, and others. But I'm going to have to do that author thing and say, you have to give her the books, because I'm running out of time here. <laughs> I'm going to move on. Now, this, uh, first ladies have taken advantage of uh, their position, this, this fabulous opportunity they have to make change by adopting causes. How recent a phenomenon is that where we, Krista, with great anticipation when there's a new White House, what is the cause going to be that the first lady will adopt? It's expected that they will an announce and Absolutely. how much politics and political consideration goes into that decision in this modern day? Quite a bit. You know, it's, as the, pres as the president is trans, well, going from a candidate to president is, has a transition team and is building it, first ladies are also doing that. And uh, Michelle Obama has, has talked about being back in her kitchen in Chicago and thinking about planting a garden at the White House and developing this idea for how she would approach this topic of healthy eating. Uh, and, and really, you know, uh, pushing back against childhood obesity, taking this on as a cause. And I think it's the cause that she has really come to, you know, embody and personify. Uh, you, you know, she is, is in D.C. working out and taking cycling classes, and she's with children eating carrots and pulling up vegetables. And, and also, you know, let's, let's move, which is what her campaign is called, there's a nonprofit attached to it. Uh, you know, not, Let's Move has brokered deals with Walmart to you know, get healthier food in stores and with Disney to pull some of the junk food ads off of 
uh, children's television. So these, these are not inconsequential things. Um, because she's first lady and this is the role, it is wrapped up in also her doing push-ups with Ellen on daytime television and dancing at the Easter egg roll. So, so you can really see the ways in which uh, first ladies take on these issues. And for a first lady like Michelle Obama, really wants to push, you know, push the issue in a way that is sustained and that makes real difference, but that doesn't feel like you're just writing a law or that it's just hard policy. Though there, she did also pack the cha you know, push the changes to uh, school lunches and that did go through Congress early on. I wanna show a, a, another piece of a video and this demonstrates that this formal adoption of a cause is a relatively recent phenomenon. Sometimes it was thrust upon them by life circumstances. This is Betty Ford and she's talking about her breast cancer. Just watch. In a few weeks, I will complete my chemotherapy treatment, and that will be another milestone for me. Since that first year, I have not talked much about the difference in my experience with cancer, but at that time, my mastectomy and the discussion about it, I was really pleased to see it because it prompted a large number of women to go and get checkups in their local communities. She changed the conversation in this country about cancer, Carl yeah. Anthony. A absolutely she did, and it was personal. And I think Michelle Obama started as personal, and Jackie Kennedy started as personal, and Lady Bird Johnson started as personal. And I think that's where the commitment starts, because of course, we only see the happy side of it. There's a lot of obstacles along the way. And let me just add one quick little uh, 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 asterisk. Florence Harding, um, way back. Uh, you know, you do find that some of these women have, feel very passionately about issues. And she was an anim animal rights advocate. And she was actually against vivisection in 1921. And so she started, at, for the brief time she was there, to really bring that issue, animal cruelty, and, and even proposed that public schools uh, adopt um, uh, homeless animals and that it's a way of teaching little adults, humans, little children about, um, through, through animals, treating other people uh, with kindness. Well, Carl, was it really Nancy Reagan and the Just Say No campaign that formalized this need to have a, a, a project? Nancy Reagan's Just Say No, it was interesting it was ridiculed by the elites, and the kids listened because drug use in high school went down after this thing was launched. I don't. I think we formalized it, but I think this thing goes way back. Michelle Obama's other. I think it's always been there. Michelle Obama's other issue is uh, getting the troops, That's right. getting the employment for the troops. Well, who would, who did that? Martha Washington did that. Um, she did it before she was first lady. She was called Lady Wa Lady Washington by the troops out of respect. Um, Ellen Wil before Lady Bird's bill, there was Ellen, Ellen Wilson's bill. It was uh, urban renewal for the poor. It was a bill in Congress. And so I, I think that this has always been a thing. We've, we've codified it lately, but I think it's always been there. First ladies have an interest, and their interest people care what their interest is. And uh, what are some of the early examples of women with causes? They may not always be full-blown causes, but there are interests. So Martha Washington, even after she becomes First Lady, has reception for veterans and soldiers. She's so concerned about them. Uh, you have uh, Mrs. Fillmore, who is responsible for, uh, for developing the White House Library. I think Dolly Madison is involved in uh, working with orphans and getting her friends involved in well. Adams. Louisa Adams is talking about, about women's rights in the early 1800s. Her husband, he's sort of the Jimmy Carter of that century, he's not a great president, a pretty good ex-president. He's in the Congress leading the argument against slavery, and her, his wife is leading the argument against, for suffrage in the 1830s. And, exactly. and, Mrs. Taft, and it was reported in the press, and it was one of the earliest recognitions by White House, uh, was behind the first health and safety regulation standards in the federal workplace. One more thing about the let's move thing. 
we've been sort of, we don't mean to, we're not arguing with your premise, Susan. It's fine. It's, uh, <laughs> it's more formal than it used to be. And, and an example is Michelle Obama's initiative, because this was an initiative that was a presidential initiative in the Eisenhower administrations and Jack Kennedy. So now, now you have a first lady doing what presidents did before, and that's literally true. So I think it has evolved and become much more formal. Well, uh, I'm, I'm going to go over just a little bit and, and really just jump to one last session before we go to the questions from the audience. And that's First Lady in the Media, which has also been a part of the role since the very earliest days. Uh, I'm going to start with the modern one, and that is this answer to the question of how Nancy Reagan managed to turn around that negative image. I don't know how many of you were around when the Reagans first came, but, but she had a very unhappy reception from the press corps. So what she did was to go to the press corps and disarm them. You've heard of the gridiron dinner in Washington, D.C. I'm going to let you pick up the story from here, Carl. What did she do? Well, she was known as this, she bought these designer dresses, right? So she's this Queen Nancy, Marie Antoinette they're comparing her to. It's got, kind of got some funny, but it's, some of it's cruel. So she goes to the gridiron. Do we have a clip? We do. We have a and clip. She Shall goes to the gridiron, and, and people then only remember Nancy herself as a former thespian, not just her husband. And she, she stole the room. Here is a clip from the Reagan Presidential Library. She's being interviewed by Hedrick Smith, a, a very well-known political reporter, telling the story of how she disarmed the press corps at the Gridiron Club. Let's listen in. guys are pretty easy, huh? She had to eat him out of yeah, her hand. Yeah, she, she, she got us. We, we were eating out of her hand after that. <laughs> so uh, back in history, just two quick images I want to show you because first ladies learned pretty early on to harness the news media to control images. This is Lou Hoover. Uh, and I'm right, first I've got Carolyn Harrison here. And this is a, a photograph that where she hired a very well-known photographer Francis Benjamin Johnson to photograph a, her grandchild, Baby McKee, who became a global celebrity. Isn't that right, Carl? And she wanted to do it because she wanted to control the public image uh, interest in her family. Rather than have them exploited. Yeah. And did it work? Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they still exploit, they were happy to get the pictures, and then they still exploited them. And Baby McKee became a... Uh, Baby McKee was like he was a cartoon character. He was used as a, like a little mascot for the administration. So you'd see this little cartoon of this little boy with the big hat of his grandfather. And another person who tried this was Edith Roosevelt, also using the same photographer. I think we have, yeah, and there's the family photograph hiring uh, the same photographer, Francis Benjamin Johnson. Um, and she also wanted to control access to that big bustling family. But at the same time, the president loved the coverage the family was getting. Until his daughter Alice was photographed um, uh, uh, winning, picking up her uh, winnings at the racetrack from a bookie. <laughs> <laughs> and then he called the press, the, he called the New York Herald editor angrily on the phone and insisted that uh, he withdraw the story, which he did. Who was the first uh, first lady to hire a full-time press secretary? It was really, well, you know, in formal terms, um, Jackie Kennedy, Pamela uh, Tenor was uh, her press secretary. But they, the others had kind of functioned in that capacity. They, they knew they needed help. They that. knew they needed help, and they had, they would, all, like Mrs. Hoover had four or five secretaries, and she had one who was very good at interfacing with, with the reporters. So 
that's how, that's how you know, that she, but she didn't have the title. Okay, I got another clip for you, because this is just too much fun. Um, you know the White House Correspondents' Dinner is another one of these big press dinners. It's actually coming up this weekend, and it has become at Hollywood on the East. It's really uh, become quite the event. Uh, there have been times when first ladies and their husbands have used that to help enhance their image. Let's watch Laura Bush at one of these just a few years ago. I said to, to him the other day, George, if you really want to end tyranny in the world, you're going to have to stay up later. <laughs> Here's our typical evening. Nine o'clock. Mr. Excitement here is sound asleep. And I'm watching Desperate Housewives. <laughs> With Lynn Cheney. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am a desperate housewife. <laughs> so, Carl, th there was a lot of criticism of the president's policies, especially among the press corps who are at this dinner. H how th did this technique of humor once again work to help the Bush's image? You know, it didn't, we're, we're at war in, that, in this time, and it doesn't change the coverage about the big issues of the day. But when people can laugh at themselves, this is true of Nancy Reagan, Laura Bush, George Bush, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, any of them. It humanizes them in a way that can only help them. Uh, Bill Clinton came in his first year as president. He gave a kind of a nasty speech at this thing. He criticized Bob Dole and people, John Kasich. Uh, by the end, he was hiring this professional writers. The comics didn't want to follow him because he was so funny. He was making fun of himself, being home alone. He had this whole skit. And it's and the first ladies have started doing that relatively recently. They are making fun, they don't make fun of themselves exactly. Nancy did it, she had to. They make fun of their husbands, that's considered okay. Um, if Hillary Clinton is president and she gives one of these speeches, the whole town will want to know what she says about Bill Clinton, believe me. <laughs> okay, this is gonna be the last clip, uh, and it's back to really what presidents have today, the tools they have, social media, YouTube and the like, but it also is a very difficult thing to manage because all day long people are commenting on, on their policies in the White House, so it's one of those giveth and taketh away things at the same time. But let's watch, you've all seen this, but this is just a nice way to end this part of the discussion, to see how a modern president uses the tools that we have of communication to help advance policy, to present their image of themselves, and uh, let's take it away for this last one. Hey everybody, I'm so excited to talk to you about the fifth anniversary of Let's Move. It's a big one. And our theme this year is Celebrate, Challenge, Champion. We're gonna celebrate hey, all the tremendous progress we've made Honey, because of people like- Have you seen my blue tie? <sighs> What's going on here? Well, we are celebrating a big anniversary. Uh, oh. What, what exactly are we celebrating? It has been five years since we launched Let's Move. Let's Move? Yeah. That's exactly what I was going to say we were <laughs> celebrating. So what's on tap for this year? Well, for starters, I'm going to ask folks across the country to give me five. I want kids, parents, maybe even a few celebrities to give me five ways to be healthy. For example, they can eat five new veggies or do five jumping jacks or push-ups or find a way to work five new healthy habits into their daily routine. Well, even I've got time for that. That's the point. So everybody, give me five. Tweet it, vine it, Instagram it, Facebook it with the hashtag give me five, and then pass on the challenge to someone else. Wait, we're still filming? Uh, yeah. And by the way, your tie is right there on the ground. Well, that's halfway to a push-up. <laughs> So really, what do our, before you answer, Chris, so what do our historians think about the state of the modern presidency and, and first ladyship today and, and what we have them do? It's always been a stage. Mm -hmm. It's always been a stage. Whether it's Andrew Jackson with his big cape 
you know, or, or Harriet Lane coming in with her crinolines and her fan and making a real, you know, dramatic entrance. Whatever the changing technology is, um, these people are experts. They're leaders. They know they're leaders. They intend to lead, and they, they own it. And so I think just like the Obamas did, you saw the Reagans do, you saw the Kennedys do it, you saw Ike and Mamie do it. They all, they all own it, and it's a stage, and they know they're on it. Edna? Mm -hmm. And the role has evolved over time, but the basics were always there. You're right. Whether it is a Martha Washington or Michelle Obama, there are certain things we're expecting of them, and certain things the president is expecting of his first lady. But it changes according to the circumstances that they find themselves in. So for our two journalists, and I might, might invite folks, we've got microphones on either side here. So if any of you have questions, I think the drill is find your way out and uh, get to the microphone and we'll get your questions in. So for, for Krista Thompson and, and Carl Cannon, I, I have to ask you though, they're doing this as a way to get around you guys. And, That's and exactly your right. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, and you know, the Obamas exist exist in a world where they're social media, and they're the, it's the first administration uh, to really utilize Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Vine. The first lady's also on Pinterest. Uh, she had a Tumblr page when she was in uh, Japan uh, and Cambodia recently, uh, and so it. And when she was there, she traveled with a uh, YouTube celebrity who asked her questions from Twitter, but she did not sit down uh, you know, with traditional reporters there. And so they, they, the way uh, her staff would explain it is, is she has a certain amount of time to do communications, and she wants to meet people where they are. And if people are coming uh, you know, to her, following her by uh, the millions on Twitter, and able to see the, the photos that they put out on Instagram, then you know it, the power of being able to shape one's own image without the quote unquote filter of the traditional media uh, is there in a way that it wasn't uh, before. Um, you know, I've, I've interviewed Michelle Obama. She did more interviews with traditional media earlier on. And, and she's a great interview. Um, Frank answers your question smart as whip, all the things that you would imagine. So it's, it's not a, a lack of capability, but it, there is a power in being able to uh, exercise uh, the ability to get on magazine covers, uh, to be on late night television, to have daytime TV conversations that shapes the conversation in a way that the White House is fully in control. Carl, we gotta get to questions. Quick response well, on that. Look. I, look, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a good cause. It's not partisan. It's not controversial. It's healthy. If anybody, you know, we don't like them going around us on, on health care policy and policy in Syria, and that's a problem, but there's nothing wrong with that. That's, and, and not everybody could pull it off as well as they did. First question over here. Um, there's, there are reports or rumors that, that two first, at least two first ladies that I know actually ran the country when their husbands were ill, and, and those were, you know, Mrs. Wilson and, and Nancy Reagan. Is, is that true or is it not true? I, I would just say, um, in, a, in a really sort of a quick response to that, that when you really, when you say the presidency, you have to look at the different components of the presidency. And one of it is making the final decision on things. Sometimes it's approving things. Sometimes it's making the decision to not make a decision. Sometimes it's firing. Sometimes it's hiring. So yes, partially, Edith Wilson assumed some of that during the, the days of real crisis. And of course, her, her real agenda was to protect her husband not from getting worse and hopefully getting better. Um, Nancy Reagan, no. I would say Nancy Reagan, um, um, uh, worked in a sense, behaved, uh, uh, fulfilled a function that might be similar to a, a, a West Wing aide, maybe a senior advisor, you know, but, but not assuming the role of the presidency. Question over here. Um, we realize that First Lady, while the husband's in office, is kind of stuck with the role. What happens to First Ladies afterward? How much privacy do they have? How much can they go off script? What's, what's, what's life like for them? Great question, Edna. Time 
uh, with Laura Bush last year, and she was um, eager to talk about how much she's enjoying life post-presidency. And, and it was interesting to watch her because she was very much shaped by an archetype as sort of a, I, I wouldn't use the word reluctant necessarily, but a, a quiet behind the scenes spouse. And, and now we see her traveling more than the former president. She's uh, working on launching a global program that will uh, bring first ladies around the world together and has done some of that in Africa. She's been in Washington with Michelle Obama. And she just sort of talked about the freedom of still having the, the platform, which uh, you know first ladies now do with the modern presidential library and museum system and uh, foundations that they can use to still talk about causes that are important to them, but to do it in a way where, you know, she could choose to sit down with the press for a few minutes, but, you know, they're not dogged by media and the kind of lack of privacy that comes along yeah. with living here. That's a subject for another whole exploration, the right. creation of these presidential foundations and the platforms that it gives them and the, the influence that they continue to have. Carl? Well, Rosalind Carter's had this great career along with Jimmy. We talk about Jimmy Carter being, the cliche is a great ex-president, and not everyone agrees with that, but he's done all these things, and she's been right there with him. And she goes, they go, they monitor elections, and they build homes for Habitat for Humanity, and she's his partner every much as she was when they were in the White House. And, and not simply a partner to him, but he's a partner to her because she is really, and she's really a fascinating woman that really gets almost no press because she does it not necessarily for press per se or credit, but to get things done. But her work on mental health goes back to the 70s, you know, when, when he was governor, and she's really had an impact in that field. And Susan, Jimmy wrote a book, and he said he was, he said, one, he's written many books, but he said he was having the best sex of his life. And, I mean, that's TMI, because he was in his 70s, and so is she. But so I guess, I, I guess the post-presidency's been fun for he her. Didn't. <laughs> but the question so, would be, does she think the same? <laughs> which, is, which is like that old Coolidge chicken joke, you know that way. How do you follow that with a... <laughs> <laughs> All can say hi. My name is Denise Bullock, and I have a question about Lady Bird Johnson. She was active in her husband's war on poverty programs, especially a Head Start project for preschools. I just wanted to know if you had any stories or any information, historical information on some things that she did. There's so much. I mean, it was Sergeant Shriver, um, who was uh, wor who was President Kennedy's, of course, uh, brother-in-law, but who worked uh, under the uh, Peace Corps under President Kennedy, and then held, headed up VISTA, which was the voluntary, a, a, a government, private, government wing of like this public-private partnership on, on voluntary stuff. And he, he came up with the idea of Head Start, and he went to her. And she backed it 100%, became its spokesperson, went to bat for it, and really helped establish it, yes. Well, and Carl, you know, she, the Highway Beautification Bill, was called the Lady Bird Bill. That's what, that's what Johnson called it when he went around twisting arms and kicking guys in the shins to vote for it on the Senate. Where's Lady Bird's bill? Uh, although that clip you showed of her critiquing a speech, he may not have liked that because when he signed the highway beautification, when he signed Lady Bird's bill on October 22nd, 1965, he never mentioned her name. So maybe that's <laughs> how he got her back for that, that critique. Here's a question from Twitter uh, from far Fresh Farmhouse wants to know, which first lady sought to be influential but was the least successful at it? I, 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 that's a really, I think in some ways you could say Hillary Clinton because she, <laughs> <laughs> no, just, <laughs> no, just meaning in terms of fairness, I mean, I mean, she always made the case that she really, when it came to policy matters, she had to make a case for something or against something like any other advisor did, and sometimes the president said no. So um, I think that that, you know, and there was some, we know of the welfare reform, there was a little bit of contention between them. Um, it's not 100% known on all the matters that she didn't win, but, um, but there were quite a few that she did not. What about Lou Hoover? She's a very talented person, but re reticent to, to engage with the press. 
and so she doesn't get, really get her story out. Do we have that Lou Hoover photo we can put up while we're talking about her? Yeah, she, th th she wouldn't even agree to do interviews with people who want to do puff pieces on her. And there's that story of the female reporter who dressed up as a Girl Scout and, and crashed a meeting and then wrote a story. She was mad and never talked to anybody again. It was, mm -hmm. I, there was a reason why she dressed up as a Girl Scout, though, because Lou Hoover took on the Girl Scouts as her major effort. It was uh, during the Depression she was trying to encourage volunteerism and... Right. Uh, and, and well, she was successful with that. Yeah. yeah. And there's the photograph. She was doing a radio broadcast uh, about the Girl Scouts trying to engage more people to get into their communities and help with a lot of the trouble going on in that age. You have a question over here. Yeah, um, and there's been this sort of interesting undercurrent, I think, through this whole conversation about how ideas of femininity and the role of women in society have really kind of influenced the expectations that women face when they become first ladies. And it's, I think it's partly why it seems like such a paradigm shift now that we're talking about potentially having a first husband. Um, and of course, there are first spouses around the world for women who are leaders right now. Um, so I'd love to hear what you all have to say about, you know, if you were advising the Clintons, you know, how should they approach that, you know, potential, you know, certainly new role for Americans for uh, the American presidency? Okay, could we get the Laura Bush clip about about the future of first ladyhood ready while our panelists are answering this? I, I would just jump in and say really quickly, because I've done some bit of research on this. Two things. Number one, Bill Clinton has essentially been functioning for these last eight years, these last uh, 12 years, uh, uh, 16 years it will be, as a first gentleman. When you look at the status he's had and the role he takes on and the persona, uh, it's not too dissimilar from the kinds of roles that uh, first ladies have played. It's usually nonpartisan. It's usually not too political. The second thing I would say is we have to look at the press during the 1984 presidential election when the Democratic uh, vice presidential candidate, Geraldine Ferraro, her husband, John Zaccaro, uh, was suddenly thrust in public. And there were all kinds of questions raised about what kind of influence does he have? Do they talk about policy? What are his business interests? And so, you know, I've always sort of maintained that while sexism is at the root of a lot of the stuff about first cities, it's really more about, you know, the unaccountable power of, of a spouse. And, and yeah, outside the realm of American history, you look at other world governments, you see that issues have come up when there has been a male spouse to a female uh, in, in power in one form or government or another. And that unaccountable power is really why we're talking about these these women. Tonight. Yeah, I've been taking a, a look at that. Um, but in terms of on the state level, because we have five women who are serving as governor now, and so and they're all married. Uh, so there are first gentlemen in New Hampshire and New Mexico, Oklahoma, uh, and a couple of other states. And, and it's interesting because they're while at the state level, spouses, whether they're male or female, can often continue uh, in their careers, the sort of official role that they play in their spouse's administration looks very much like what first ladies do. I mean, they take on projects with the executive mansion in the state and they're responsible for restoration. You know, they usually have some sort of cause, whether it's big or small. Um, the first gentleman of Oklahoma actually um, posed for the front of a cookbook, and the and the uh, proceeds went to a nonprofit. And he like has his apron on, and it's grilling with Wade Christensen, and he has a platter of uh, chicken and ribs. And so, I, you know, it's a macho cookbook, but it's a cookbook. And so, it's it, the the role of the spouse, like like Carl was saying, still remains that of a support. Um, if, the, if the family has small children, often, and this is as marriage has changed generally, right? You're seeing that the spouse who is not the governor, male or female, is the spouse that then becomes more responsible for caregiving and takes those sorts of things on and pairs back their career because their spouse has the more important job. We had a chance to interview Laura Bush for this uh, First Ladies Project, and now I'm wishing we picked the clip where she has just a little edge to her voice where she says, you know, I wonder if they're going to critique the kind of ties they wear, you know, the same way that we do with women. But the interesting question really is not should they receive a salary, but should they be able to work for a salary at their job that they might have already had? And I think that's what's, uh, what we'll have to come to terms with. Um, should 
you know, will, I mean, for certainly a first gentleman might continue to work at whatever he did, if he was a lawyer or, or a whatever. And so I think that's really the question we should ask is should she have a career during those years that her husband is president um, in addition to serving as first lady? And we are about to see over the next year and a half or so all kinds of questions that come up as this, this new situation is thrust upon us. Well, we have about five, five minutes left. And I'm going to ask you all to wrap up because there was a section we didn't get to, which is the game changers. Who are the women throughout history that ha were in this role that really made a difference? That people, if they're curious in this topic, should spend a little time and find out more about them. Edna, do you have an answer? Eleanor Roosevelt. I, I don't think that you could find anybody who, who fits that, uh, that title more than Eleanor Roosevelt. This is a woman who, uh, well-educated, had real serious concerns about where her country was, was married to the most powerful man uh, in the country, in the world perhaps, but she had her own agenda. She, she was writing uh, news columns, she was doing a radio, she was in newsreels. Uh, she was defying the DAR, you know, resigning her membership. She was a member of the board of the NAACP. Uh, she's doing her own thing. And so she's, it may be that there's never been a, a first lady before or since like her. But I think that she sort of stands alone. That there's what she was able to accomplish at, as her own self, not just as the extension of her husband and her husband's interest, but what she was actually able to accomplish on her own. Carl, it's extraordinary. Carl Cannon, well, who would you I, say? I would say Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> um, for the, all these reasons, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of other examples. Um, she. Roosevelt's out courting Southern Democrats so he can win re-election again and again. She's, she's confronting him privately on this. There are riots in the shipyards. These men are fighting, the, the, fighting World War II. We're fighting racism. We're fighting Nazism. You can't let these shipyards be segregated. She's pushing him. When she doesn't get satisfaction with him from him on this, which is quite often, she goes outside him to other people in the party. She's a social liberal at a time. That means you're a racial liberal. And she goes and she has rival power centers, and she's not afraid to call people. Um, she, that newspaper column that she writes, now this is a precedent so strong. Uh, Bess Truman didn't want to do it. Mamie Eisenhower didn't want to do it. But it, it was a precedent so strong, it's not gone away. And now they all do it. This interview that Michelle Obama gave the other day, you could hear echoes of Eleanor in it. Personal stuff, policy stuff, it's all seamless. She, they, the first question they ask her is, well, what's the best, coolest part of the job? And she says, well, you know. Well, who have you, oh, I got to meet, you know, the Pope. I got to meet George Clooney. I got to meet, I got to meet the Queen. Mm -hmm. And, but then she talks about policy stuff, too. And it's, it, it, to me, Eleanor is the prototype. Yeah, her column was called My Day. My Day. And she went through the... Serious, trivial, right, that's interesting. Right. Krista, do you have an answer? I, I do. I, I would say, first, that I'm eager to see how history remembers Michelle Obama. And, uh, two... I, I'm a Texan, and so Lady Bird has a, a special appeal for me. I love that clip that you showed earlier because it, we know what a tough guy LBJ was and how he spoke to people and the way that she just tames him in that conversation. <laughs> it's quite brilliant. And, and also what Carl Anthony mentioned a little bit earlier, the work that she did on beautification and the ways in which we can now see in retrospect that that really laid some groundwork for the environmental movement that we all know today that did not exist in the way that it did then. And being from Texas and growing up seeing don't mess with Texas signs everywhere and the appreciation for the blue bonnets there and just um, what that means and to know that she in her role as first lady influenced all of that in a way that was quite subtle and not necessarily understood at the time, but that we now do understand. Now, Carl, Anthony, I'm going to ask you, because you're a scholar of the full breadth of First Ladies, give us some names we haven't heard. Um, well, Dolly Madison, because she was one of the first who had a real sense of duty to a constituency, meaning the country. It was um, unusual for a woman back then to perceive as part of her proper role a sense of duty and connection to the, to the general public, to people she didn't know. Jacqueline Kennedy, very strongly, because of her sense 
of where the US was in the Cold War, how democracy um, could be presented in a way that it hadn't, and that, in a sense, America had come of age and had as much dignity and had a right to maintain that dignity on the world stage. And she did that in sort of ways. Betty Ford, by taking very, very personal um, and really emotional issues and not, not losing the power of that, but using that to help others. I think it's those like Michelle Obama, very much like Eleanor Roosevelt. I mean, I have to agree, it really is Eleanor Roosevelt. And, but, but they realize time is ticking. Anything can happen in a moment. Your husband could, could die, be shot, resign, anything. You have this opportunity to make a change. People are going to like you and hate you no matter what. They're going to like you and hate you because of the way you look, because of what they think about you, because of what you say, because of everything. And you've got to say, the hell with it, and do, get, use the time to get it done. Those have been the game changers. As we close here, I actually want to say thank you to a panelist who's been invisible, and that is my colleague, Mark Farkas, who I can see. He's in a booth right back there. He was uh, the executive producer for our First Lady series and helped with the schedule and pulled all of that clip, all those clips and, and on all of the, uh, the video and, and pictures. So thank you very much, Mark, for what you've done. Uh, So for our C-SPAN audience, sorry, but those of us who are here get to have dessert and coffee. You guys will have to find your own. But I'd like to invite on behalf of C-SPAN, anyone who's here to stay after, we are going to have a book signing and a selling. And I have to tell you, that always makes me feel rather embarrassed to say, buy my book. But I want to tell you, if you are interested in buying it, all of the proceeds of the book go to the C-SPAN Education Foundation. And we use it to uh, do teacher scholarships, student documentary contests, and things like that. So if you buy it, you're helping with a good cause. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. And thank you to our panelists. Thank you very much. They were great, aren't they? They were great. And by the way, they will all stay. And if you'd like them to sign your book, they're the valuable signatures. Oh. Yeah. <laughs>